Good evening, friends. We've been invited here this evening for the second part of a forum which was held the first part in Georgetown last night, Forum on the Identity of Jesus Christ. Just briefly, the, the format of this evening's forum will be this. The first speaker, Mr. Frank Abel, the TV host of the recent series, Great News for the World, will speak to the subject, Why I Believe Jesus Christ to Be the Son of God, Not God the Son. Mr. Abel will speak for 30 minutes. Immediately following that, Dr. Drickmer of the Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Georgetown will speak to the subject, Why I Believe in the Deity of Christ. Dr. Drickmer will speak for 30 minutes. After the two 30-minute speakings, there will be a period of questions for one hour. The questions should be directed to either Mr. Abel or Mr. Dr. Drickmer through myself. They will reply to the question. The other will have an opportunity to reply to the reply. So if you will, direct your questions at the conclusion of the two speeches through me to either speaker. Because of the topic, it is felt that a public prayer may not be suitable to both parties, and therefore, if you would rise with me, we would have one minute of silence. To the topic, why I believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, not God the Son. Good. Dr. Drickmer, Dr. Sales, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We read, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's on the basis of that verse and that instruction that we are engaging in this forum tonight. And I would personally like to acknowledge, by way of thanks to Dr. Druckenberg, to come here to Shelburne and to engage last night in Georgetown in this kind of a forum, because it was unusual that this forum should ever be put together. There were several pastors of churches in this area approached on the basis that they disagreed with what the Christadelphians taught, who would not engage in such a forum, in fact, who would not engage in discussion at all, and could only show us the door of their own particular congregation. I would also like to thank the Christadelphians that have opened the door of their own meeting place to such a forum as this. Many churches ban any possibility of a meeting like this where someone who believes different than the church believes is allowed to speak in their building. Whether the Christadelphians, on the basis that they believe the Word of God, if it's presented, will only present one point of view, are obviously not afraid to have alternating voices uh, speak on a subject like this, for it is the conviction of Christadelphians that when the Bible is open, truth will be forthcoming. I think you will enjoy this evening's presentation more than last evening's presentation, because I had no previous knowledge of Dr. Drickmer's views, and I doubt very much whether he knew what I would be saying. Tonight presents a more studied view of the subject, having some opportunity to react to what was said last night, however still under the same topic, and it's that topic to which I'd like to address the following remarks. The Christadelphians 
and myself in particular, believe that the Bible teaches one thing only concerning Jesus Christ, that he is Son of God, not God the Son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, which is the basis on which we have done our study and our research for this presentation, and indeed for our beliefs concerning Jesus Christ, we read, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And it is of paramount importance to me personally and to Christadelphians in general, that whenever we present a belief like we are doing in this forum on the identity of Jesus Christ, that it be positively backed up by what the Bible does say. And we make a distinction, a very clear distinction, between what man's wisdom teacheth and what the Bible teaches. The idea of Trinity is not found in the Bible. The word does not occur. The expression God the Son is not found in the Bible. It does not occur. The idea of the incarnation, the word does not occur. The ideas of a God-man, such as Dr. Drickenberg presented last night, does not occur in the Bible. These are things which man's wisdom teaches based on historical uh, events, historical meetings, which are well documented in books like the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it's important to note the views of the Trinity were not the teaching of the first century church, but were things that came to the forefront sometime, centuries, in fact, after the completion of the Bible. So in getting back to what the Bible teaches, I really believe we must forsake the use of terms which are not biblical. The Christadelphian belief is what we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. This was the declaration of the apostles concerning Jesus Christ. This is what I believe. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved of God, which I believe in. Not God approved of God, because that doesn't make sense. It's what the Bible says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. And it's based on that declaration and confession of one's faith, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that we find eternal life. Nowhere does the Bible say that eternal life is bound up in declaring or confessing that Jesus is God the Son. That's not biblical. So Christadelphians feel no compelling feeling that they should be required to feel that Jesus is God in order to be saved. Such declarations are not found in the Bible. What is found in the Bible is what Christadelphians believe. Another verse, John 11, verse 27. This is what we believe concerning Jesus Christ. Martha said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And it's this expression that Martha uses, should come into the world, that we like to echo and, and re-echo in our remarks tonight. What the people were looking for in the day of Jesus Christ was the one whom the prophets said should come. And it's important to remember that in certain things which Jesus himself used in his phrasing of words, because he was testifying, I believe, to the fact he was the one who should come, not that he was God. And I'd like to look at those verses in particular. Let's start with John chapter 3, verse 13. Now, Dr. Drickenmer used this verse last night to illustrate the omnipresence of God, and in particular, the fact that this is said of Jesus Christ, the omnipresence of Jesus Christ, therefore he had the attribute of God, therefore he must be God. But look at this carefully. 
It says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now that seems to be rather incomprehensible at the first of how a man can be on earth and at the same time in heaven. There is no suggestion that I can find in the Bible to support the idea that the Son of Man was in heaven at the time Jesus Christ was in his ministry. God was in heaven, yes, because Jesus prayed to God, and Jesus prayed to God the Father. But there is no supportive proof that the Son of Man was in heaven at the time of Jesus' ministry. The Son of Man must indeed have been the Son of Man. And the only way the Son of Man has a sense and meaning to us is that Jesus was born of Mary. That's what the Son of Man phrase refers to, Jesus born of Mary. And it was obvious where Jesus, the Son of Mary, was. He was on earth. He was engaging in his ministry. So why then even the Son of Man which is in heaven? Well, if you are familiar with the Gospel record of John, you will notice various times, in fact, a number of times, that John interjects in the account to put in little pieces of testimony that he himself has included, not words of the Lord Jesus Christ, not words of anyone else, but a commentary to further explain things. I believe that is the words of John himself. Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Period. John said, Even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And I suggest that is at least a logical answer. It's an explainable answer. And if we look at a few other cases, I'll show you that it's substantiated by the way John uses the record. Look in verse chapter 2, verse 24. Is this the word of Jesus, or is this the word of someone else? But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That is obviously the words of John commenting in his gospel record on something that needed further elaboration. Have a look at <coughs> chapter 3, verse 24. It says, For John was not yet cast in prison. It was a comment inserted by John when he was writing his gospel to further explain and expound the situation that was, as it was developing. It was characteristic of John to do these things. And I can refer to a number of others in John's record where he did that. So I offer as a more logical explanation of even the Son of Man which is in heaven as being the situation that John added this at the time of his writing because at the time of the writing of the Gospel, Jesus was in heaven. Let's look at John 8, verse 28. A point raised last evening to illustrate that Jesus must be God because... He said, I am. Notice the verse carefully. John 8, verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now, Dr. Grickemer rightly said last night, the word He should not be there. In a sense, it's not in the Greek. The original Greek does not contain the word he. But I ask you the question, and Dr. Grickemer the question, why is he there? Why did the translators put in he? They put in he, I believe, because that is the sense in which it is to be understood. Now let's assume that we believe that wherever the word he occurs in a situation like that, we should leave it out. And please turn with me over the next chapter, chapter 9, verse 8. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, I am he is like him. But he said, I am he. Now the he is there because it's the way to give the sense to what was being meant. It would seem to me, and I don't know Greek, I'm not a student of Greek, that although the word he isn't there, it's required to be put in there, as the translators did, to get the sense. If we leave it out, and we make a rule that it should be left out, 
what have we got? We've got the blind man saying, I am. And using Dr. Druckenmiller's explanation, the blind man saying, I am God. Now that's not proper logic. It's not the way the scripture should be used. In no sense was the blind man God. We find in a number of cases that this is characteristic again of the gospel, the gospel of John. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. What were the people looking for? They were trying to identify Jesus Christ as the one who should come. Jesus Christ was very particular to fulfill scripture that people might believe that he was the one who was to come. It's logical, therefore, and I'm only using a few of the references we could produce, to believe that in this case in John 8, verse 28, where Jesus said, I am, it's important to include, as the translators have put in, I am he. I am the one who the prophet said should come. And the works that God was doing by him were testifying to the fact that he was indeed of God. And so the blind man testified in a later event that this man could do nothing except God were with him. Who ever heard before that a man could open the eyes of a blind? Certainly God was with him, and the evidence was in the mighty works that he was doing. Another point, and Dr. Griffinmer has stated that this is a very key point, is John 1. I'd like to have a look at John 1. The Christadelphians traditionally have not been afraid of dealing with verses that seem to prove the opposite point of view. We are interested in truth, ladies and gentlemen, and we cannot exclude any verses from our perusal. Indeed, if someone has a belief concerning Jesus Christ or a belief concerning God, where they exclude half the chapters of the Bible because they're afraid to look there because they don't say what they believe should be there, it's a very poor belief to maintain. And so we do not shy away from John 1. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Dr. Gerkemer says the Word was Christ. But the fact that the Word did not become flesh until verse 14, and if you relate that to the fact that is displayed in Luke 1, verse 35, that Jesus came into being on the basis of the Holy Spirit, the power of God overshadowing Mary, and that which was born of her was to be called the Son of God, then we can understand the word becoming flesh did not become so until some time along in history, certainly the history of the Bible. So there's no evidence from John 1 there that in verse 1 we can say the word at that time was Jesus Christ. Let me show you the way the word is used. The word, word, logos in Greek, is used in many different ways. There's no, and I'm sure Dr. Griffin would agree with this, that there's no way that you can take the word logos by itself and say it always refers to Jesus Christ, because it doesn't stand up to that kind of test. The word conveys the idea of what we generally mean in English by word, a declaration, a thought, some, some idea. In the beginning was the word. Well, look at what's associated with that word, if you like, in Psalm 33. In the beginning was the word. Well, what did the word do in the beginning? Psalm 33 talks about the creation. It says in verse 6, By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made. Now was that Jesus Christ that's referred to there as the word? Or does it mean something else? Well, I think the context explains what it means. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Word equated to the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heat. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. 
Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The idea of creation contained in Psalm 33 is not that the word was a being, Jesus Christ, but that the word was the breath of Yahweh. It was by his commandment that the earth was made, testifying to the, to the strength, to the tremendous power that is underlaying all of God's word. If we look in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus uses this word, logos. Look what he says. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. That was Jesus' estimation of the word that he had. He testified to the fact, all right, you might, we might say, uh, if the word was made flesh, then we must adore the flesh, because the word was made flesh. Jesus tells us, don't adore the flesh, the flesh profits nothing. He says, don't admire the flesh, and that's exactly what Isaiah tells us. It tells us that when people looked at the body of the Lord, there was no beauty in him. There was nothing in the physique of Jesus Christ that men wanted him to be king. He was despised, rejected of men. And Jesus rightly testified, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto thee, they are spirit and they are life. And he also said very clearly that his words were not his own, but were his father's. So there is no advantage to the build-up that seems to come in the arguments in John 1, that this will therefore lead to us believing that God was indeed before us when we saw Jesus Christ. Indeed, Jesus Christ manifested God, voluntarily did the commandments of God, voluntarily he restrained himself from the works of the flesh, so that when a person beheld Jesus Christ, they beheld a sinless being. They beheld the image of God. But in the same sense, we are required to stand up and be examples. We are required to be, if possible, the image of God, in that we will do only what God commands us, and we will refrain from evil. I would like to look at John chapter 10, because here is another critical verse. We alluded to this before. I'd like to look at it more carefully. <laughs> In verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now notice, this is exactly what we are trying to disprove in this presentation tonight. This is exactly what Dr. Grickenberg is trying to prove, that Jesus was God. The Jews said, Because of what you've done, you are making yourself God. Now how did Jesus deal with that? Jesus said, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? Where is it written in their law, I said ye are gods? Well, your margin refers you to Psalm 82, verse 6. Let's have a look at it. Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said... Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now, if this was addressed to the judges, the elders of Israel, which were obviously men, and in some cases, not very righteous men, then the idea that a person being called God, making them God, just cannot be equated. And what does Jesus therefore say? He says, Say you of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I, am, I have said I am the Son of God? Well, obviously, that would no longer be true. Because if he has said of the children of Israel, I said you are God's Elohim, and you are all the children of the Most High, then Jesus could not in any sense mean that he was very God by saying he was the Son of God. And that's Jesus telling us, what he was. He was not God. He was the Son of God. And that's what we are affirming tonight. 
If we go one step further in this approach, because we have had pointed out to us certain references in the Old Testament where the memorial name of God is used and applied to Jesus. To have the memorial name of God likewise does not make one very God himself. Please note Exodus 23. The words of God came to Moses. Verse 20. Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. And we're told that a being, in fact, three beings, came to Abraham. One, as the record tells us, had the name Yahweh. Now we know from other evidence relating to the same event that these were angels. So we have quite ample evidence in the Old Testament that the angels bore the name of Yahweh. They weren't Yahweh, obviously, and they, they weren't, because Jesus, made a little lower than them to start with, was exalted far above the angels. So because they had the name Yahweh, they were not God. No, it's very much like a person who represents a firm saying, Bell Telephone here, or Massey Ferguson here, or whatever he might be representing. He's told, or she is told, that that's the way they must answer the telephone. In no sense are you talking to the company. You're talking to a representative, an accredited representative of the company who is allowed to use the name in that fashion. So when we find Jesus has the titles of God, called God, given the memorial name of God, it doesn't make Jesus very God. All it does is testify to the fact that is founded in Philippians chapter 2, that God exalted Jesus Christ and gave him a name which is above every name, to the glory and the honor of God the Father. It's not that there's a competition, it's that God has so ordained it that Jesus should get this honor for a certain time period. Now, I'm very much afraid of the view which is being voiced by Dr. Gurkamer. And the Christadelphians, of course, would find no value in such a forum as this. There would certainly be no value in us debating an issue for only an intellectual exercise. There's far more at stake, ladies and gentlemen, than an intellectual exercise here this evening. Eternal life and eternal death are at stake here this evening. I'd like to show you that on the basis of 1 John chapter 4. It is my firm conviction, having looked and having reasoned as best as I can through the evidence that we have of the belief of the Trinity, that this is what was being mentioned by the Apostle John in 1 John 4. He says in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. And the spirit of Antichrist was identified with the teaching that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. Dr. Grickemer says that Jesus Christ was man and God. But if he was man and God, ladies and gentlemen, he could never have come in the flesh the way the Bible demands that he did. The Bible says certain things about him, <laughs> such as are found in Philippians chapter 2. I'd like to refer to that. If you would please, Philippians chapter 2, and verse 8. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 3, at verse 7. 
talking about the the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's chapter 5, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus Christ required, was required to have the nature of man in order to be the sacrifice pleasing unto God. In no sense could Jesus be tempted and tried as we are, yet without sin, if he knew he was God, if he knew of the glory he had with God before the world was, and he could recall it all his lifetime, even through when he was a child, if he knew that really he couldn't be tempted because it says God can't be tempted with evil, then in no sense could he really have accomplished what the scripture says he did. The teaching that Jesus Christ was a God-man, or that he was God, is equivalent to teaching that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. That's a very prevalent teaching in the world today. It almost unites all of Christendom. In fact, some would say that Christadelphians must be excluded from Christianity, from Christendom, because of our rather unique teaching on who Jesus Christ is. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest to you it's the very reverse. That what is uniting Christendom, the teaching of the Trinity and the teaching of Jesus Christ as the God-man, is the very teaching of Antichrist thoroughly condemned in the Bible. Thank you. And now, friends, for the next 30 minutes, Dr. Drickerman will speak to the subject, Why I Believe in the Deity of Christ. Please give him your kind attention. Dr. Drickerman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a little bit surprised tonight to see some of the same faces that we saw uh, last night in Georgetown, but even though some of you are here tonight who were here last night, nevertheless I'm going to give the same presentation tonight I gave last night because that was our agreement and I am an honest and honorable man. So I will abide by our agreement and deliver the presentation tonight which I gave last night. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Dr. Martin Luther wrote those words in his small catechism, but it is also my personal confession of faith here today. The Lord Jesus, Jesus is both true God and true man, yet only one person. Christians in different branches of Christendom have called him the God-man, and they are right, for he is the God-man. We believe this truth not because it is the word of man, no. We believe this truth only because it is clearly taught in the word of God, the Bible. And that is what I want to show you today. I do not suppose it needs to be proven here that Jesus was and is a true human being. The Bible tells us that he was born as a human being, though without a human father. The Bible says that Jesus is a man, that he has a human body and soul, that he walked and talked on earth, that he hungered and ate, thirsted and drank, got tired and slept, wept, suffered, died. Jesus was and is true man. And that point is not an issue here. But many people do not believe that Jesus was and is true God. God's word, the Bible, is very clear in saying that Jesus is true God. And I want to share with you several ways in which the Bible tells us that Jesus is true God. My topic for tonight is why I believe in the deity of Christ. What do we mean by asking why? When we ask why, we are often asking about the reason or basis for something. 
There's another frequent meaning for why that we can put that off until a little later. First, let's ask the question this way. What is the reason or basis for my belief that Jesus Christ is true God? The only good answer to such a question is this. Because the Bible says so. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God because the Bible says so. I'm going to show you that the Bible teaches us about Jesus' deity in several ways. It calls Jesus God in so many words. It says things about him that can only be said about God. It says that he does things that only God can do. And it tells us to worship him as God. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God because the Bible calls Jesus God in so many words. I knew a man once who told me that he had read the Bible twice, but he said that the Bible did not say that Jesus was God. I wonder what Bible he was reading. Maybe he was reading with the television blaring at him. It's truly amazing that he could read the whole Bible without finding one passage that called Jesus God. I know of at least ten passages that call Jesus God. Let me share some of them with you. In John 20, 28, we read that the Apostle Thomas, after seeing the risen Lord, called him, called Jesus, my Lord and my God. And in the very next verse, Jesus commended this as the correct faith. In 1 John 5, 20, it says about Jesus, this is the true God and eternal life. In Romans 9, 5, we read about Christ, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. That is true. John 1, 1, the opening verse of this gospel, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word here refers to Jesus Christ. For in referring to Jesus' conception and birth, the evangelist writes in John 1, 14, The Word was made flesh. Titus 2, 13 speaks about the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is a reference to his second coming, of course. We must not forget the well-known prophecy given through Isaiah, a prophecy of the birth of Christ. In Isaiah 9, 6 we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. Isaiah calls Jesus the Mighty God. In Psalm 45, 6, we read, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And those words, including the name God, are applied directly to Jesus in Hebrews 1, 8. Now, I could list a few more Bible passages and go into a discussion of them, but these are more than enough to show very clearly that the Bible calls Jesus God. So when Christians confess that they believe that Jesus is true God, they are simply echoing the language of the Bible itself. Remember that 1 John 5.20 calls Jesus the true God. We are all aware that the Bible uses several other names for God. The Bible applies these other divine titles to Jesus, too. Uh, we only have time for me to give you a sampling. But since the Bible is the Word of God, even one passage is enough to prove a point, as long as we understand that passage in the light of the rest of Scripture. In the Old Testament, God is frequently called Jehovah. Some scholars today write this name as Yahweh, but we are really not sure how it was originally pronounced. It is usually translated Lord, and in most translations, when Lord represents the name of Jehovah, it is written all in capital letters. 
We all know that the New Testament frequently calls Jesus Lord. It is easy to show that the New Testament uses Old Testament verses with the name Jehovah and applies them to Jesus. Let's look at three cases. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In both cases, the word Lord is Jehovah. The Apostle Paul uses that term, one Lord, to refer to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where he tells of one Lord, Jesus Christ. Psalm 97 is about Jehovah. In verse 7, the angels are commanded to worship this person who has been called Jehovah. Now Hebrews 1, 6 applies this verse directly to Jesus. The angels are to worship Jesus. In Joel 2, 32, we read, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. The word Lord there is again Jehovah. St. Paul quotes these words in Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who does he mean by the term Lord? Just a few verses before he had been talking about the Lord Jesus. So the Old Testament and the New Testament are united in telling us that Jesus is true God. This can be shown in quite a few other ways too. For instance, at the burning bush in Exodus 3.14, God named himself as, I am that I am, or simply, I am. But if you look over the New Testament, you will find Jesus several times calling himself, I am. Unfortunately, this is translated into the King James Version as, I am he. But the King James Version uses italics to show when it adds something. The word he is in italics in the passages that I'm talking about. As an example, let me read just one of them, one of these verses, without the addition by the translators. In John 8, 28, Jesus told the Jews, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am. Other examples are John 4, 26 and John 8, 24. I cannot resist showing you just one more way in which the Bible gives Jesus a divine title. In Isaiah 44, 6, we read, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. By the way, in both cases the word Lord there translates Jehovah. But the point now is that God is the first and the last. But you know, the New Testament gives that title to Jesus. In Revelation 1, 17 to 18, we read, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And in Revelation 22, 13, we hear Jesus say, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So the first reason why I believe that Jesus Christ is true God is simply that the Bible calls him God. And it calls him God using several different titles of God. But there is more. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God because the Bible says things about Jesus that can only be said about God. Let me give just a couple examples. God is eternal. <coughs> Jesus is eternal. We read in a prophecy about his birth, Micah 5, 2, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. 
Jesus said that he was eternal when he said in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. God is almighty. Jesus is almighty. His miracles prove that he is almighty. And he also said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's Matthew 28, 18. God is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere. While he walked on earth, he still called himself the Son of Man, which is in heaven, John 3, 13. And at his ascension into heaven, he still promised his disciples, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Matthew 28, 20. God knows everything. Jesus knows everything. Peter said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. That's John 21, 17. And Paul said about Jesus, whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That was Colossians 2, 3. Those are some of the things that can be said only about God, but are also said about Jesus in the Bible. They also show us the deity of Christ. But there is more. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God because the Bible says he does things that only God can do. For example, Jesus participated with the Father and the Holy Ghost in the work of creating the whole world. And he still participates in preserving the world. We read in Colossians 1, 16 to 17. <clears throat> For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Another good example is the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said of himself, The Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Matthew 9, 6. Many more examples could be given. These show us that the Bible says that Jesus does things that only God can do. So Jesus is true God. But there is more. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God because the Bible tells us to <coughs> worship him as God. We all know that God is a jealous God. Exodus 20 verse 5. He will not give his glory to another. Isaiah 42 8. And we remember the first commandment, where God prohibited worshiping anything but himself. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 23. That's chapter 20, verse 3. It is a very serious sin to worship anyone or anything who is not true God. It would be a sin to worship Jesus if he were not true God, as he claimed. But what does the Bible say about worshiping Jesus? It says that Jesus should and will be worshiped by everyone. Jesus said in John 5, 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Jesus deserves the same honor the Father deserves. In fact, Jesus says that those who do not worship him are not worshiping the Father either. Those who do not believe that Jesus is true God are not Christians at all. They simply do not know the true God. Several other passages could be quoted showing Jesus receiving worship, such as Revelation 5, 12-13. But let us close this section by remembering that at the end of the world, when Jesus comes again, all people will worship him, whether or not they had previously believed in him. Of course, at that time it will be too, too late for those who have not believed. A while ago I said that there was another possible meaning for a why question. When we ask why, we can be asking about the purpose of something. I am telling you why I believe in the deity of Christ. <coughs> I want to tell you about the purpose or goal of that faith. Not to worry, this section is not going to be as long as the last one. 
In fact, this point is my conclusion. Why do I believe in the deity of Christ? Why is it so important to me? Because only God could save me from my sins. A mere man, even a superman, could not save me or anybody else. In Psalm 49, 7 we read, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. It is impossible for a mere man to pay God a ransom for someone else. That's what this psalm says. There is no means at the disposal of a human being to redeem anyone else. But that is exactly what Jesus came to do. <coughs> Matthew 20, 28, he came, it says there, quote, to give his life a ransom for many. If he had been only a man, he could not have redeemed or ransomed even one other person. But instead, he redeemed the whole human race. The Bible says, he died for all, 2 Corinthians 5.15. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1.29. The Bible teaches that the whole human race is sinful and desperately in need of salvation. Without salvation, everybody would go to hell forever. The only one who is not a sinner is Jesus Christ himself. But here comes the main theme of the whole Bible, the great substitution. Jesus took our place. He took our guilt upon himself and was sacrificed for our sins to turn God's wrath or anger away from us. There is salvation only in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, 6 we read, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died for our sins and rose again to prove that they had been fully paid for. We can be saved only through faith in this Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, who is true God and who alone could pay the penalty for our sins. In John 8, 24, we hear Jesus say, If ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. This is one of those passages where Jesus applies to himself the divine name, I am. Jesus tells us that those who do not believe in him as true God do not have their sins forgiven. <coughs> faith receives the forgiveness of sins. But faith that is not faith in the real <coughs> Jesus is not real faith. It does not receive the forgiveness of sins. That is why this matter is so important. When I meet people and they find out that I am a pastor, they often want to reassure me that they have true faith. They say, oh, I believe in God. That answer does not satisfy or reassure me at all. I want to ask them, but do you believe in Jesus? I started by quoting something from Dr. Martin Luther's small catechism. Let me conclude by finishing that quote. I believe that Jesus Christ, the true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Friends, at the uh, conclusion of this evening, there will be coffee and tea, light refreshments for the children, and some bickies.
And at that time, I'm sure that Dr. Drickemer and Mr. Abel will gladly engage with you in a conversation regarding their discussions this evening. So the next hour, in which we will accept questions from the floor, I would like to uh, reiterate from last night that it is only questions that will be acceptable. Comments on the content will not be accepted from the chair. So the questions should be, if possible, directed to one or the other and alternating if possible. So for the next 60 minutes, you have an opportunity to question the speakers on the subject that we have discussed this evening. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ray mentioned... Uh, Would you speak up, please, so that everyone Dr. can hear? Dr. Ray mentioned about uh, Jesus uh, being all... No, I'm sorry. Well, I'm that, too. That Jesus knows everything uh, as God does. I wonder if he could explain to me Mark 13... <coughs> Verse 32, which says, in which Jesus says, But of that day, in that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. <coughs> this is, of uh, course, related to several things that were brought up last night, and I think I'm going to answer it by uh, reiterating that I believe that Jesus is true man, as well as true God. This is a great mystery which we cannot fully comprehend, uh, but nothing that we say by way of asserting that he is true God is meant to deny that he is true man. So I see no problem for the doctrine of the deity of Christ by saying, uh, whether we use a passage like this or whether we would refer to uh, Luke 2, 52, where it says that he learned. Uh, I don't see that we have any, any problem there since we're admitting that it is a mystery which cannot fully be harmonized by our puny human intellect. We simply accept all of the biblical facts. Uh, now... Uh, as to this particular instance, uh, we can simply say that Jesus knew everything, but he did not always exercise his omniscience, just as he did not always exercise his omnipotence, uh, or, for instance, just as he, for, for the most time while he walked on earth, did not let his divine glory show through his physical body as he did at the Transfiguration. So, in other words, just because I have the power to do something doesn't mean that I'm uh, that I have to do it constantly. He is refraining at this point from the use of omniscience in his human nature. I'm afraid I have to disagree rather strongly with that suggestion. The people accused Jesus at the time of his ministry that he had a devil. I don't think there could be anything more blasphemous than to accuse Jesus of having a devil. If you try to understand, maybe Dr. Grickenberg doesn't think we should try to, but if you try to understand a dual personality, you've got a schizophrenic, which is equivalent to having a devil in terms of what people in the olden times thought of mental problems. <laughs> you could say if Jesus was a God-man, he's a schizophrenic, he's a multiple personality. That's not the way the scriptures define Jesus. Look at Mark 16, verse 6, a few chapters on from the actual event. The Bible in no sense deals with Jesus Christ as being part here and part there, or being part God and part man. When Jesus arose from the tomb, the angel said, in verse 6, He saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where we laid him. The complete association of the word of God is with the body. And it never suggests that Jesus had a split personality, that he was part God and part man. 
And I think the suggestion that he had is really accusing Jesus Christ of having a devil. And that is almost, I would think, the utmost of blasphemy. Could I ask? I wonder, uh, sir, if the, you could stand so that the people in the back could hear the question. Thank you. Could I ask Dr. Guggenmeyer, where does evidence cease and mystery begin, especially if we're called upon to give to every man a reason for the hope within us, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. That hope, of course, we now embrace is eternal life, judgment, whether we reign in heaven, whether we reign in earth, whether we die or whether we can live forevermore, whether we can obtain forgiveness of sins or whether we can't. I didn't hear your opening words, which were, I mean, I heard everything else. What, what, what words did you The gist of the question was, where does evidence cease and mystery begin? The only evidence we have currently is the word of God written, the Bible. Uh, what the Bible says, we believe. All that it says, we do not use part of it to try to disprove another part of it. We believe all that the Bible says. Uh, so in other words, believe all of the evidence. <coughs> Where the Bible does not speak, however, we do not presume to theologize. This is a principle in uh, Lutheran theology called sola scriptura, scripture alone, the Bible alone. Uh, another way to put that, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, not human reason to uh, contradict the Bible. So the point being that we would accept all of the facts attested to in scripture, all of them, whether or not we can explain them. If scripture has left something unexplained, then we must be satisfied with that lack of an explanation, at least in this life. Another question? Yes, sir? Several occasions uh, during the talk, Dr. Dirkmar, you made mention of the fact that in the, the New Testament, when the word Lord occurs and applies to Christ, it's referring to <coughs> effectively the, the title of Yahweh or Jehovah, as you used it, which applies to Christ. In one of the questions that was asked of you last night was regarding the death of Jesus, you stated that, in fact, Jesus did not really die, but it was his body that died, and that his spirit, or his soul, whatever, continued on. So I'd assume from what you said last night that you're speaking about the man, Christ Jesus, in that respect. I refer you to 1 Corinthians 6, 14, and I was wondering, in that passage when it says that God raised the Lord, will also raise us, the human beings, up by his power. But if the Lord there is referring to Jesus, and that is Yahweh, which is very God. And that passage says that God raised very God as he will also raise human beings up from the dead. Could you please answer that question? Yes, in the first place, I did not deny that Jesus died last night. Jesus did die. His death was, I believe I refer to it as the human death of the Son of God. His death was the same as any other human death in this, that it meant the separation of his human soul from his human body. So he did really die. Also, I'd like to say we must be very careful not to separate Jesus into two persons, one God and one man. This uh, was an ancient heresy that was also condemned in the early church. Uh, the point is that he is only one person, that person is both God and man. Uh, it is true, the Bible says, that God raised Jesus. It is also true that uh, the Bible says, and I, I, 
it, I wasn't prepared to speak on this point tonight, but it is true the Bible says that Jesus rose. So it puts it both ways, uh, that he was raised and that he rose. Uh, a good example would be, would be John 10, 18, where he says that he had a, a power to take his life again after he laid it down. Uh, so I would say that 1 Corinthians 6, 14, um, it doesn't present any problems. Uh, God raised the Lord. It's also true that the Lord rose himself. I might say this, uh, if you look at 2 Corinthians uh, 13, and many examples could be given in Paul, but 2 Corinthians 13, verse 13, uh, is one example we, in the church usually referred to uh, the persons of the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. St. Paul also used these names uh, that we see in this verse, Christ called Lord, the Father called God, and the Holy Spirit called the Holy Spirit, or sometimes just the Spirit. So for the personal names of the persons, Paul used the words God, Lord, and Spirit. And, and other examples could be given to uh, show that those were the personal names of the person of the Trinity, or uh, as often used by Paul. Remember that for the uh, Greek world, the Greek-speaking world to which Paul and the other writers of the New Testament wrote under the inspiration of God, uh, the word God was not a particularly exalted word, since they believed in, in Jupiter and all those, uh, the whole pantheon of gods. Um, so, actually, it can be shown on the linguistic evidence that Kyrios, Lord, if anything, is a stronger divine title than, than the word for God. Do you have any questions for Mr. Abel? Yes, sir. The uh, question I'd like to address to Mr. Abel is with regard to a comment that he made um, that the Trinity was not a first century belief. I'd like to, in support of that, first of all, um, quote from Edward Gibbons' Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I'd like a question, please, sir. Well, the question is based on. Is the well, question based on what Mr. Abel said? Yeah. It is. Okay, proceed. Okay. Um, the, the comment that Gibbon makes is that Christianity offered itself to the world armed with the strength of the Mosaic law and delivered from the weight of its fetters. An exclusive zeal for the truth of religion and the unity of God was as carefully inculcated in the new as in the ancient system. And he goes on to say that the first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were all circumcised Jews and the congregation over which they presided united the law of Moses with the doctrine of Christ. But they soon found themselves, this is the early Christians, overwhelmed by the increasing multitudes that from all the various religions of polytheism enlisted under the banner of Christ. The question then is when did this um, theory of the Trinity actually start? If we assume that we're given the correct news. <coughs> well, I'd rather the Trinitarian answer the question and tell you the truth. <coughs> Because I see in the theory that is expounded in the Trinitarian doctrines that this teaching really must go back to the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks believed that gods could inhabit human beings. The principle of incarnation was well established in the minds of the Greeks before I believe it ever became Christian. And the idea that there was one in three, and three in one, was also a belief that was held long before the the uh, actual belief came into the Christian church. So in terms of, of seeing how these things merge, I'm quite sure that they did have their roots in something not Christian. But the actual dates, how it came to be, I think is, uh, it is certainly not in my command. And I'd much rather anyway that a person who was a vegetarian and who should know that uh, would be able to give that answer. <coughs> Thank you.
the uh, word Trinity was first used by the Christian theologian Tertullian near the end of the second century. The word uh, as a Latin word, Trinitas. Uh, so that word, we, we can say when it started. However, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, as shown in and known in Scripture, uh, goes back, I would say, uh, to, uh, uh, well, eternity, since the Trinity is eternal. But we can point to Genesis 1.1, which uh, already contains the whole doctrine of the Trinity. However, I would point out that the, that was not uh, exactly the topic tonight. It was the, the uh, uh, deity of Christ. That was the topic tonight. It would take uh, a presentation of equal length uh, to show the doctrine of Trinity in Scripture, a presentation equal as long as the one I gave. So the, <coughs> the uh, Trinity is eternal. Since so God knows himself, the doctrine of the Trinity is eternal. It's found throughout Scripture, beginning with Genesis 1. Uh, it is, uh, cannot be documented to have arisen with uh, the Greeks or in any secular source since, frankly, it is antithetical to uh, all ancient philosophies, and, and new philosophies, too. Yes? Uh, I'm curious, you say that we should not split Christ into two beings, but are you not doing that yourself? You do not split Christ into God and man? And in Job 34, it says, if God withdraws his spirit, all flesh should die. So that if God died in Christ, Christ being God, then all, all we would have all perished. Well, your, what is your question, please? How did you explain it? <laughs> <laughs> Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness, just in the flesh. This is a great mystery. The fact that it has been told to us, and essentially our doctrine is the facts, all the facts revealed in Scripture, uh, without using human reason to deny or dispute them or explain them away. Uh, the, uh, we cannot put, I'm repeating myself from last night, we cannot put uh, the earthly life of Christ and his death into any time relationship with the Trinity, so that he could still call himself the Son of Man, which is in heaven, during the time when he walked on earth. Never does the, uh, his uh, human death have anything to do with interrupting his role as governing and preserving the universe. How? I can't explain. But then I can't explain either how you're alive or I'm alive, uh, in biological terms even, for instance. So the fact that I can't explain something doesn't doesn't matter to me. I can only give I can only give a partial explanation of how the car works, <laughs> but I, I I have a very practical knowledge of how it works because I got up here tonight. So. Does God explain to us how Please. it works? Dr. Lippman has answered your question, and as best as he can, he has answered your question. I might make a comment here in terms of explanations. Um, I don't know that maybe this would be a good opportunity not to make an apology, but to certainly give an explanation to Dr. Grigamer why so many questions are coming his way. Point of order. Okay. He's only Fine. supposed to comment on my point. The point I was trying to make is in the Epistle of Jude. And this is a Christadelphian heritage, and it's the reason why we believe it's essential to find explanations and not to back off into saying, I can't explain my own uh, things of my own life, I can't explain this, therefore, how should I explain the Bible? There is no precedent for that kind of an argument in the Bible. Rather, if one goes to the Epistle of Jude, verse 3, this is the precedent upon which we should all operate in trying to understand what the Bible teaches. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. 
Now that is the basis upon which my presentation has come this evening, and on which I believe all presentations concerning God's Word should be made. That we should earnestly contend for what was delivered unto the saints. And when we have to come to the point of view that we can't explain it because it's beyond understanding like many other things, I think it shows where we are in our ability to explain it, and that's all it does. It certainly does not testify to whether or not a particular question is explainable. My question, Dr. Dirkemer, is based on John 10, a passage which you quoted in answer to a question the gentleman over here about the resurrection of Jesus, and hence his deity. In John 10, 17, reading from the Revised Standard Version, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again, from which I understand you to say that Jesus rose himself. <coughs> no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This charge or commandment I have received from my Father. Now it seems to me in this passage that Jesus has power then delegated to him, and my question is, is there any part of the Bible in which Jesus, by virtue of his own deity or personage, has power to raise himself? I, I refer to verse 18, not to verse 17, but verse 17 is, is as good as uh, verse 18, frankly. Uh, offhand, this would be the key and central passage. I think this does say exactly what you were asking. It doesn't say that he didn't have this power himself, but that he what he received from the Father was the commandment to do it. Now, the commandment to come to earth and suffer and die and rise again uh, in no way puts Jesus in, a, in an existential uh, or ontological or metaphysical or real inferiority to the Father, but only obedience. Obedience does not imply inferiority. Uh, as I said last night also, um, for example, I know one uh, seventh grader was asking me a question about this, and I knew that her father was uh, a sergeant in the <coughs> army. And I said, your father is a sergeant, right? Right. Does he take orders from the lieutenant? Yes. Is the lieutenant a better man than your father? No way. Now there's just a, one example of what I'm saying. The fact that he obeys the father does not uh, uh, make him inferior. It does not have that logical conclusion anyway that you can draw from it, that he's inferior to the Father as to his being, only that he's obedient. I think that uh, was a very uh, inappropriate answer in the sense that it really didn't answer what the questioner was asking. The questioner, as I understood it, was asking, in what way could Jesus have power? What other scripture suggested that Jesus had the power the ability, the capability of raising himself from the dead. And I don't know of any. And Dr. Gertner didn't show any. So I don't believe he can uh, show any that would illustrate that Jesus had the power to raise himself from the dead. The fact is that the only reason Jesus came from the dead was because God, who was not Jesus Christ, who was the Father in heaven, raised him from the dead, as it testifies very clearly in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, God raised him from the dead. The only sense in which Jesus had power was the authority. Let me have a look at a verse here which suggests this. If we go back to John chapter 1, and verse 12, it's the same word that's used here, 
to illustrate in what sense he had power. It says, but as many as received him, he, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, there was, there's no power in us to become the sons of God. There's no ability that we have to become sons of God because, as your margin rightly, if you have the King James, rightly defines the word power, it's the right or the privilege to. And that's exactly what is meant back in this passage in John, that Jesus had the, the right or the privilege to lay down his life and receive it again on the basis of being obedient to God. Now what it is also saying, and I think it was the idea of the question, is that if Jesus had no power at all, if God hadn't raised him, he never would have been raised. The only basis on which Jesus was raised related to himself was that if he kept the commandments of God, if he was obedient to him, then God would do his part. He was, if you like, a bargain. Jesus did this, God would do that, and Jesus knew that before the event of his resurrection. But the power, the way in which he was raised from the dead, was completely supplied by one greater than him, something he could not do himself. May I just ask, I'm referring to a passage that you quoted from Micah. And to whom uh, are you addressing the question? Dr. Reckermer, um, the, you know, the context of the quote was within the words, God is eternal, Jesus is eternal. And you quoted from Micah and the second verse, But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, be of old, from everlasting. Are you aware that Strong's renders those words, whose family is saint, in the sense that obviously that it could refer to his descent, A from God and B from Adam. I wasn't aware that uh, Strong, are you referring to the concordance? Yes. I wasn't aware that uh, he had translated it that way. Uh, but that doesn't <laughs> bother me since Strong is not the authority, the Hebrew text is the authority, which uh, I believe is correctly translated there, uh, that, that Jesus begin, uh, going forth with him from of old, even from everlasting, which puts him in the same category uh, as uh, Moses was speaking in Psalm 90, uh, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, which refers to the whole Trinity, but I'm pointing here to the from everlasting being the same. So, you know, strong doesn't burn me. Yes. Well, I think the answer that I would give to that text is uh, that is a consistent answer in Strong's with the uh, other parts of scripture that relate to Jesus' origin. Now why, for instance, does the gospel record give us the genealogy of Jesus Christ? What value is the genealogy of Jesus Christ if indeed he wasn't uh, man anyway, in the, in the sense that except that Jesus Christ was indeed the son of somebody, he would never have been born. And why is the genealogy given in two places of Jesus Christ? It's because in the sense of Hebrews chapter 2, that God fashioned the ages around Jesus Christ. All of what's found in the Bible is relating in some way to Jesus Christ. Because as the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, he was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now there, if you want something for everlasting, there you have it. In the plan of God, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1 that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Even we, in God's eyes, were chosen before the foundation of the world. This way that we find scripture gives us the answer to other scriptures. It's not using a scripture to destroy a scripture. It's using the process we started off defining, comparing spiritual with spiritual. You don't destroy something by comparing it. You define it, you develop it by comparing it. 
And when you look at the, the reason that Jesus had a genealogy, it's because it was essential. People were looking for the son of David. They said the son of David has to be born in Bethlehem. Because they didn't know that, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Christ. They didn't know he was born in Bethlehem. Because he came out of Egypt, and then he went to Nazareth. But if they had accurate knowledge of Jesus, he did fulfill the scripture entirely. He was the son of promise to Eve. He was the son of promise to Abraham. He was the son of promise to David. And the apostles, and the prophets, and the Psalms, and the law, all have testified to this event. All of these ages were fashioned around Jesus Christ. No wonder his goings forth have been from the old. Because in God's plan, everything was fashioned around this man, approved of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the back of the white shirt. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Rickemer, if I could. Uh, I understand to say, Dr. Rickemer, that uh, God commanded Jesus to come to wood. Uh, where in the Bible do we find that? Uh, that, that, that uh, sentence or that quote. Can you tell us, give us chapter and verse Well, offhand, there would be you know, several that I'm thinking of. I suppose for the sake of simplicity, I could just refer to John 20. Uh, about verse 20 or 21. where he says that uh, the Father sent him. I'm not feeling too well, so I'm going to stay seated. But I'd like to ask Mr. Abel, I'm not sure if I understood. Do you believe the Bible to be the inspired and inerrant word of God? Yes. You do? Okay. Going on that, I didn't understand. Could you go back and explain what you were talking about when you said in John's Gospel, John was adding to? It sounded rather humanistic to me. Okay. If John was inspired and inerrant, he was inspired yes. and inerrant. Yes, well, I wasn't saying he was making errors. Okay, he was, I was saying was he, he was doing it humanly, are you saying? I was saying he was adding explanation to the text. For instance, come to the last chapter of John. Another example is in uh, John chapter 20. Well, John was the gospel writer. Yes. So, who said the words in verse 30 of John 20? Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John wrote them. Okay. Yeah, they were appended to all of the statements concerning what Jesus said, and what the apostles said, all the, all the verbal exchanges that were recorded. Various times had these comments included. John makes a comment to help us understand the text, to amplify certain things. I find it quite characteristic of John's epistle, or of the of, of, uh, gospel record here to say that. So that when I was given the answer to John chapter 3, verse 13, I said this has to be understood in the light of the fact that John was making these kinds of pointed comments that were not the words of Jesus, were not the words of anybody who spoke them at that time, but were comments that were added so that we can understand the text that was applicable to John 3.13. Um, for instance, in John 12, uh, verse 16, we have another one. It says, uh, let's just go see how this merges. In verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So you have, you have uh, John giving the account. You have certain words given there as to what the people were saying. 
And then in verse 14, Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, John's adding this, as it is written. Yeah, Jesus didn't say that, as it is written. He's adding it. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And then he makes a further comment, These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that those things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. Then he goes back to the record, The people therefore that was with him when he, gave, when he called Lazarus of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. So John is merging all kinds of things into the gospel record. And I'm saying that one of the things he's merging into it is a comment time to time without any warning really that he's going to give you a comment like that. And we have to understand that that is in the text. But that is still inspired. Certainly. Yes. It's still inerrant. That's right. Always. Yes. I don't believe there's any errors in that at all. John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to comment, uh, to make various comments in his gospel, of course. However, the, the fact that that happened several times in the gospel does not mean that it happened in John 3.13. You have to look at John 3.13 as a specific case in point and find something in the context to prove that that is an example of John uh, um, adding something rather than a continuation of the words of Christ and the mere fact that uh, in Greek that is not even a clause but it is a participial phrase and we translate that into English which is in heaven but it's a participial phrase very literally but woodenly it would in English be the son of man uh, the one being in the heaven it's a participial phrase uh, here used uh, as an adjective, you remember from high school grammar that uh, participle can be an adjective. In fact, it is a verb. Uh, it's usually used adjectivally. Uh, so the fact that it's not even a separate clause here uh, means that we can't say that John just stuck the words in here. That part of what Jesus said is, is absolutely clear from the Greek text. 